Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service here at Hope Evangelical Presbyterian Church, and a very special welcome to all of our visitors. Psalm 31, verse 24, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Please silence your cell phones. Pastor Curtis, Don, and Carol Flatter, and Marion Bradshaw have just returned from the week at the Presbytery General Assembly. Two opportunities for Bible study on Sunday morning from 9 a.m. to 9.30 and Tuesday from 10 to 11. Our 10 to 11 Tuesday Bible study is finishing up with the study of Hebrews. Pastor Chris will be next leading us in the study of Romans. Everyone is welcome. It is helpful to everyone if uh, you wear your name tag. They are located just around the corner in the rack, in the rack alphabetically. Enjoy some fellowship time with conversation, coffee, and cookies the second Sunday of each month following worship. Pastor Chris is in the process of scheduling home visits for those uh, people who are in need. Food is still being collected for the Avon Pantry. Please help if you can. There's a bin at the entrance of the church. Place all non-perishable or canned goods inside the receptacle. In closing, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Another couple of notes as we're getting started. Um, did everybody get the handout for Let Our Souls in Him Rejoice? All right. So if you could raise your hand if you need one of those. And oddly enough, I am raising my hand. <laughs> so, and uh, thank you. Oop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And everybody should have an, an, additional, uh, an additional sermon scripture sheet as well. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things about these additional sheets, this one in particular is, um, we're going to sing this one quite a few times during our Ephesians series, so we'll get used to it. You know, part of congregational singing is um, having having things in a key that we can sing in, and we're working on that, and having things uh, with tunes that we're familiar with, and we're working on that, and having uh, those help to bolster congregational singing, so we're working on that, and this is one of the ways we're doing that. In addition to the concept in the text here, it uh, goes right along with our Ephesians serve, uh, sermon series. Um, once again, Sunday. It is a good day. And it's not simply a second chance to do a Saturday. Uh, in a sense, all the, for the Christian, every day is belonging to the Lord because you belong to the Lord. And nothing that you have, apart from your sin, uh, doesn't belong to him. And even in a strange way, he did take it upon himself on the cross. And so in his wisdom, he thinks it good for us to gather together with each other, um, to sing hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs, to encourage one another, to hear his word read, to give ourselves to him and commit ourselves to him again. And so in his wisdom, one time a week we do this and we gather together. And again, it is not lost on us that for a period of time we were not able to gather together. And so uh, that is what we are here to do, is to worship him who calls you out of, his, out of darkness into his everlasting light, that we might proclaim his excellencies. So with that in mind, please find hymn number 104, O Worship the King. Please stand if you are able and hear the call to worship from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. May the Lord be with you and also with you. Praise the Lord.
Uh, we turn to confession. It is always right to approach God on his terms. He says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so with that in mind, we look at our prayer of confession. It says here, merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We've not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Does anybody recognize that little phrase? Psalm what? Psalm 51. Okay. And there are a couple other Bible phrases drawn straight from the scriptures in here as well. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. That's Psalm 51 as well. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. And again, uh, it should be freeing for us to come to our Heavenly Father. Uh, isn't that what every parent, when their kid goes astray, hopes that they will come back to them? Isn't that what our desire as parents has been and grandparents? And it's no different uh, it's no different with your heavenly father. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that our instinct comes from him. It's not that he is like us. We are like him in that way. So with that in mind, uh, let us come before our heavenly father in confession. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness. In your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Amen. And we confess individually as well. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray these things. And all the people said, Amen. Now lift up your heads and hear the good news to you from God. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And friends, that is absolutely good news to you right here and right now. So... If you find that to be good news, please stand to your feet and let us pronounce glory to our Father with number 813. <laughs> continue uh, proclaiming the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would love even people like us. With hymn number 495, Jesus loves even me.
sing. Well, in its beauty I see the good King. This shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Please let us continue to rejoice in the Lord Jesus with our hymn insert, Let Our Souls in Him Rejoice. Expand my soul, arise and sing the matchless grace of Zion's King. His love as ancient as His name, let all thy power seated, we turn our attention to prayer this morning. And as is our habit, we will augment our printed prayer sheet. What would we add to our prayer sheet this morning? Sue? The people of Ukraine, sure. Okay. Pray for the Queen of England. What else? Sandy Blake's surgery went well, and she she is uh, home recuperating. She got out the same day. Is that? Do I remember that correct? Next morning. Next morning. Close enough. Yeah, pray for Sandy's good recovery. Okay, anything else this morning? Okay, uh, Marion has a family friend named Harry who's uh, battling uh, a reoccurrence of leukemia, so you can pray for Harry. Ruth Woodward for her surgery this, or this week. Okay, Ruth is going to have her surgery this week. Ruth Woodruff. Jim? Strength and wisdom for our leaders. Yeah, strength and wisdom for our leaders in our country, absolutely. Anything else? All right. Uh, just, I'm going to ask that you would pray for one of our two prompts. Uh, one would be that you would pray for our General Assembly. Uh, just a few highlights of the things that happened there this week. Uh, if you don't, if you've never been, you don't know what happens. Um, it's where we do the national business of our church. So things that 
uh, particular policies for the denomination happen there. They're voted on there, discussed there. And uh, we approved the production of a paper over uh, for lament and hope over racial issues. Um, and it'll probably take a couple of years for that to get, we, we simply approved that a paper would be written and the mechanism how to have it written. So there's no paper yet. So it might take up to two years. <laughs> and it'll be a pastoral letter. So in the EPC, we've got the Bible. That's the center. We've got the Westminster Confession, which is our doctrinal standard. We've got our Book of Order. We've got position papers. And then we've got pastoral letters. So the further out the circle you go, um, the less constitutional weight those things carry. So, uh, but it's, uh, it was a good thing that we started that process. We also approved a method of um, funding the denominational level. Um, for years, it's been called a per member asking, or, and uh, we, uh, the assembly wanted to move that to a percentage of income rather than a per, per, per head tax. You used to call it head tax, right? Um, we also uh, did some work on a paper for our chaplains, our, particularly our military chaplains, giving them some, uh, seeking to give them a document that would give them cover as far as what their commanding officers might command, what kind of services and uh, relations they might have, their commanding officers might make them be in. And they could say, oh, well, I'm sorry, you know, sir, my denominational affiliation does not allow me to participate in this way. So that was a good thing. Uh, I got to meet uh, part of the uh, part of the process of Hope Church calling me here was uh, we went through a process with a thing called PIR Ministries, and part of that package was a year's worth, a monthly coaching session with a coach, not like a football coach, but like a church pastory kind of coach. And so I got to meet uh, with my coach, Tom, who I had only seen on a video screen. So I can confirm to you that he's a real person because I saw him eat a sandwich across from me. And then uh, one of the big themes was uh, the EPC has decided to adopt as a tool for reaching out this method called the three circles for evangelism. So you'll be hearing about that uh, coming up. It's a real... It's a conceptual way, and and to just to be uh, clear, they, they, you know, the EPC is kind of a grassroots denomination, and we're not super top-down heavy. And they say, if you're use, if you have a tool that you like, please go ahead and use it. They're just interested in us doing evangelism. But if you don't have one, here's this one that seems to be pretty easy to wrap your mind around and and get a handle on. So uh, we'll offer that to you at some point in time. Um, so that's kind of a recap of things at GA. Obviously, there are a bunch of intangibles. So uh, we got to fight with the navigation system in the Flader's car on the way. Um, had some conversations along the way, conversations with friends there, met new friends. And so that's a little recap on GA. So I'm going to ask that you would pray for our our general assembly, the office and the staff and the work of our denomination. And our second prompt today would be uh, our outreach as Hope Presbyterian Church, okay? Um, the, the phrase that keeps popping back into my mind is that if someday somebody says, what are you about at Hope Church? And this isn't, you know, this isn't written in stone. This is just one of the things that popped into the pastor's head. What does Hope Church do? Uh, we experience hope in worship, and we extend hope in witness, that makes sense? Maybe that's our tagline, experiencing hope in worship and extending hope in witness. Because, I mean, obviously you get saturated with the word hope there, right? <laughs> that's why I've always called you the people of hope, right? Okay. So I'm going to ask that you would pray that we would, that we would be able to discern how the Lord would have us reach out from this place. Because it is clear that he certainly calls us to worship him. Uh, but but isn't, it, isn't it more glorious that the more people worship the Lord, the more glory us it is? Um, all right, I've gone to wandering. But if, 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 
if the end goal is the earth is filled with worshipers of the Lord, and you look around, and you think, well, we got, we got room, right? Every church in Lake County has got room. There's room. And we do not serve a stingy God who's stingy with his grace. So I have to always ask myself, why, why am I not sharing that grace more and more with those who don't know it? All right, enough, enough of that. We're going to pray for our outreach here at Hope Church. All right, with that in mind, let's, let's look at our, and I've been forgetting this. And again, part of, the, part of the deal is we're trying to get as much scripture in us as possible. You've got a scripture lead into prayer here. It's Psalm 88, 1 and 2. Psalm 88, 1 and 2. Let's read that together. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. It appears to me that I, that I lit that fuse a little too early, so now that we've all got our bulletins, let's, let's do it together. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Let us pray. Father, we do cry out this morning before you. And we ask that you would let our prayers come before you, that you would incline your ear to our cries. Because, Father, we do confess that it is good to gather with your people and to consider who you are, <clears throat> to consider the ways we have been lavished upon in the Lord Jesus Christ, to consider the ways you've blessed us so that we might be a blessing, to uh, thank you again that we live at a fabulous time to be alive as far as creature comforts go, that uh, we can have body parts replaced, knees and joints and hips replaced, and be back on our feet, that we can uh, talk to people from family and friends great distances away through uh, phones or video, and yet, Father, as wonderful as those things are, we do look out at our world and we do notice the brokenness and the hurt and the need and the want. And so, Father, uh, we have been blessed by you. It is our desire to be a blessing to others. So, Father, we would pray for those who are afflicted. We would pray that you would give them comfort. So, Father, we do ask for comfort and healing of those afflicted. We would remember <clears throat> Sandy as she's recovering from her surgery. Father, we would pray for a man named Harry who has relapsed into his leukemia. <clears throat> Father, we pray for Ruth as she's awaiting her surgery. Father, we would pray for the people of Ukraine and that the uh, conflict there would stop and that the church would be, uh, the, the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be a witness there. Father, we do pray for the Queen of England as she's uh, getting on in years and has reigned for quite some time. We pray for her. Father, we also pray for Mary Frances Scalopoulos, Kyle Soretti, Charlotte Van Hook, Heather Hart, Chuck Holtz, who's with us this morning, Marlene Kraft, Jill Clemens, Arta Smith, Denise DeRogi. Father, we remember those who are battling with cancer, Shirley Wood and Dan Driscoll. And Father, we do pray for our missionaries, the Birdsouls. Uh, Young Life, Capernaum, Love, Inc., Thule, the Huber and Mapendi families, that you would uh, show them how you would have them to get the good news about Jesus out. And Father, uh, the summertime for the past few summers has been very raucous. So Father, uh, we know that you know better than we can observe the upheaval that has gone on in the last couple of years. And Father, we know that this is just a never-ending upheaval. Uh, these are the most recent ones, so they loom large for us, but we know there have been times like this before. But Father, that doesn't lessen the need for, uh, for our leaders to seek to govern in harmony with the scriptures rather than against the scriptures. And so Father, we pray for our national leaders, both those elected and those appointed. We pray for our president. We pray for the Congress. We pray for the judicial branch and all the staff. 
goes along with all of those, uh, that they would seek to, to rule justly as the scriptures define justice. And so, Father, uh, we do pray that the peace of Christ would reign, that God's law would be upheld. And we pray that, uh, that people would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that simple, simple conformity to a governmental law does not produce change in the heart. Neither does freedom from a governmental law produce change in our hearts. Only the Holy Spirit working in our hearts produces change that lasts for eternity. So, Father, we do pray and put our country in your hands, asking you to work. Father, we would pray for our General Assembly and uh, how it works as our national body and, uh, and the work that was transacted at the assembly this week, and we do so now. And Father, we would also pray for the outreach here at Hope Church. Uh, Father, you know us, <laughs> and you know, uh, you know where we find ourselves located physically. Father, you know uh, the makeup of our group here, our people of hope. And so, Father, we ask that you would give us wisdom in how we might reach out and serve our neighbors both in real physical, tangible ways and also uh, making new friends in order to present the gospel of Jesus to them. So, Father, we pray for the outreach ministry here at Hope Church, and we do so now. And Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus because he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, uh, we thank you for your contribution to the ongoing work here at Hope Church, uh, that, that we as a people of hope would be an outpost of hope on Allegheny Road and in our county, in our state, and indeed uh, across the nation and across the world. So uh, the offering box is out in the entryway, and you're more than welcome to send contributions to the address on the screen. Let's, let's pray again. Father, again, we thank you, and we confess that everything that we have that is good has come from you. So, Father, we give ourselves to you again today. And if there's anything we can't give, we invite you to take it from us so that Jesus would be glorified and the kingdom would be built up. Take our time, talents, treasures, even our very dreams, aspirations, and desires. We, we give them to you. We ask them to use them. We ask you to use these things so that uh, many more men, women, and children can come to know the Lord Jesus or come to know him better. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We now come to the reading of Scripture again. And again, we've got a, a responsive reading again this week. So let us uh, go to the reading of Scripture. Good morning. I will start us off, and the response from you will be in the bold print. 
Our scripture reading is from the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance upon which we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Let's pray as we're getting started again today. Uh, Father, we ask that you would teach us to learn to set our ultimate affections on you and you alone. That we would, uh, you would help us to unlearn our habits of setting our attention and affections on everything but you. And so we give ourselves to you again. Holy Spirit, come and work in conjunction with your word. Uh, Show us who we are and show us who you are. And show us how we might live in light of those two realities. Uh, Holy Spirit, come and do your work. You are non-negotiable. Use your word and power. Um, Make us more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but But words can never hurt me. me. I doubt that there's anybody in here that hasn't heard that. You have absolutely heard it, I agree. And uh, culturally, we use this phrase to try to instill some kind of resiliency in us, or in our children particularly, right? Uh, We talk this way with our children to try to help them navigate life in this world, to help them know that sometimes it would be best if we didn't put a lot of stock in what others say. So we teach them this little saying. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we do know that words do matter. And they matter a lot. And they're interesting because they can be both cheap and powerful. That's the interesting thing about words. So what we are going to do this morning is we're going to look at God's word to us in Christ. 
And we're going to seek to trust him when he uses these words about us, as we've seen, as we've used these named words that we've been going along with. So that knowing these words, getting them down deep into us, would provide us some resiliency as we live in our time and in our place. So we start out this morning in verse 7, 7 and 8. Look at it. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And we see what we have been seeing all along, that these little words that I've been, we've been pulling out, hello, my name is, saint, adopted, predestined, chosen, uh, these are all the ways that grace and peace come to us from God. But they only come to us through the channel of Jesus, in him. That's what it says right there in the beginning of verse 7. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. If you were to pull out all the words that the Lord has used about his children in this longer passage, and indeed in the book of Ephesians, um, you would see that the Father speaks these words names, these identifiers, to the folks who are in Christ. And so if you are trusting Christ, and these words are for you, they are good for you, they are true for you, whether you feel like they are true, whether your friends, relatives, and enemies would think they are true about you, and whether the world, no matter what the world and the flesh and the devil says about them, about you, they are true. Why? Because God spoke those over you, and he does not lie. God has spoken these words over you. That's why we're taking time to unpack them as we go by. And so I want to today have this ring in our minds, that sticks and stones will break your bones, but the words of the Lord will define us. Sticks and stones will break our bones, but the words of the Lord will define us. Let's try that. Sticks and stones will break our bones, but the words of the Lord will define us. Good. We'll get some more practice on that. So the identity words that we're going to look at today, there in verse 7, we see that we have redemption in Christ. So if we were to turn that redemption into a name tag word, what would it be? I've got redemption, therefore I have been redeemed, right? So on your hello my, in Christ my name is, name tag, it would be redeemed, right? Because we have redemption. Now, this word, redemption, the underlying imagery has to do with being bought from or being ransomed from or freed from or released from slavery. We have seen that when we orphaned ourselves and became slaves of sin, that the Lord has released us and redeemed us in Christ. We are no longer slaves to this cruel taskmaster over us known as sin. As pictured for us in the book of Exodus. So the, 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 one of the primary Old Testament uh, images of being redeemed or freed from slavery obviously is the what? The Exodus, right? So in some ways when you look back and you read in the Exodus about Pharaoh and how mean he is, we can think that's kind of how our sin is. It's mean to us, demands stuff of us, it's cruel to us, won't let us go, right? Until Christ the strong man comes along and defeats the Pharaoh of your sin. So we think back to the Exodus, just as the people were brought out of the land of slavery, that was a picture of any of God's children who have been brought out of their slavery, have been redeemed out of their slavery, not simply helped a little bit, Right? Think about the Exodus. Did God say, you know, I'm going to probably get about 60% of you out, and, uh, and some of you, I'm, I'm going to leave you stranded right at the gate of Pharaoh's kingdom. So you're going to have one arm in Pharaoh's kingdom and one arm outside of, was that how he did it? Oh, he brought them out. His promise was to get them to the promised land. Did they get there? Oh, well, corporately as a nation, Yes. He's able to get them out. They were rescued and redeemed. Look at your additional sheet here, your small sheet. Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 8. This is what God tells his people. 
For you are a people holy or set apart to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Okay, so he brings them out of Egypt and Moses is telling them, God chose you, right? Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And then he tells them why it wasn't. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. It wasn't anything in you. It wasn't that you had politically 51% of the vote. It was in spite of that. Verse 8, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and what? Redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It wasn't Israel's greatness. It wasn't anything in them that caused them to be brought out from the land of slavery. It was something in the goodness and graciousness of God. You'll remember that uh, just as during the Passover, the blood of the lamb was uh, the thing that spared God's people from the angel of death. Right? Remember that? God said, take this lamb, put the blood over the, your doorposts, and when the angel of death passes through, it will pass over you, and you will be saved. So just as the angel of death passed over because of the blood of the lamb in the Passover meal, so too for us, the blood of Jesus is what spares us, what brings us out, what redeems us from our sin and the death that it causes our verse 7 in our big passage says, In him we have redemption through what? Through his blood. Small sheet again. Colossians 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Again, in Revelation 1, 5. Let me, let me, let me get, get you in on a little Bible trick here. See how it says Revelation 1.5 and then a little B there? That means I'm only quoting a section of the verse to you, okay? So know that that's not all of verse 5, okay? So we need to be careful. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his what? By his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. 1 Corinthians 9. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were what? Bought with a price. You've been redeemed. So glorify God in your body. So, Christian, if you have trusted Christ, you have redemption. You are redeemed. So sticks and stones may break your bones, but the words of the Lord define us. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but you've been redeemed and freed from sin by Jesus when he hung on the big sticks of the cross and when the stone was rolled away from the tomb. So our first name tag this morning is what? Redeemed. Okay, good, good. Now, back in our big passage. Uh, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So just as if, if you have, have redemption, you are called redeemed. If you have forgiveness, you are called forgiven. So that's our second name tag word, forgiven. You are forgiven. This is the identity word that God has spoken over you. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses. Okay? If, now, here's the other interesting thing. If you have redemption, you have been forgiven. If you have been forgiven, you also have Love. redemption. Say that again. Love. Oh, there, that's absolutely where we're going. Absolutely. So again, as we've been looking at these words, if, if our salvation from God is a precious jewel, it has all these facets on it, and each facet kind of brings out the light in a different way. But it's all the same jewel of our salvation. If you've been redeemed, you've also been forgiven. 
No one who has been forgiven has not been redeemed. It's a package deal, but they are a little bit different because they have underlying concepts. Redemption deals with freeing from slavery, and forgiveness has to do with a debt owed. That's why, uh, that's why you turn on the news, and there are a lot of people that are interested in having their, uh, their student loans forgiven, right? So they owe a debt. Loan forgiveness, right? Because they owe a debt. And in the scripture, at least here, uh, the reason that we need to be forgiven is because of our trespasses. And so because of the, the, over, the overlapping of trespasses and debts, that explains why you go and again you say the Lord's Prayer and some people are trespassers and some people are debtors, right? Okay. We need to be forgiven of our trespasses. And, and a trespass is when you've overstepped your bounds. So if, and it's kind of ironic when, a, you know, if it's private property, you, it's already trespassing if you go on it without permission. And yet we put a sign there that says, you know, no trespassing, which kind of like, it probably just makes it easier to enforce or something. But so when we trespass, we overstep our bounds. Um, and, and we probably have a decent understanding of what, of what it, need, what it is that we need to be forgiven by God. Because in our trespassing, we not only step on the boundaries that he's created and step outside of them, we also step on the boundaries of our neighbors. Okay? So we need to have our trespasses forgiven. And again, the only way that this happens is at the cost of the blood of Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness through his blood. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses through his blood. This came at a cost. Just as the blood of the sacrifice in the Old Testament pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus himself on the cross. Um, and as we saw in our Hebrews study, that the problem with having the forgiveness of your trespasses in the Old Testament is that every year they had to go and make these sacrifices. But it's not the way in Christ. Christ. Look at Hebrews 9 in our small sheet. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal what? Redemption. For if the bloods of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All that is a very long way to say that when the, the blood of Jesus does its job. In the Old Testament, they had to do it every year, every year, every year. And the weakness of that system was that it wasn't once and for all. When Jesus comes and gives his blood to redeem you, it's once and for all. Hebrews 7.22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. So again, in the Old Testament system, these priests had to be replaced from time to time. Why? Because they died. How many times did Jesus die? One, and he came back to life. How many times will he die from now on? Zero, right? So he can be your high priest because he's always going to live to make sacrifice, to make intercession, to plead for you on his, to plead your behalf before the Father. Consequently, verse 25, he's able to save to the what? To the what? How much does that sound like? Does that sound like 60%? Does it sound like Dove Soap 99 and 99 hundredths? No, the uttermost. Jesus paid it mostly? No, Jesus paid it all, right? What this means is that Christ guarantees and 
your redemption and your forgiveness from first to last. When he, ex when he was getting ready to breathe his last breath on the cross and he said, it is finished, what he didn't say is, and also all my followers have a lot of things to do to make themselves right before God. He did not say that. All the work that his father had sent him for had been completed by him. And that includes securing your salvation, your redemption, and your forgiveness for your trespasses. Indeed, sticks and stones may break your bones, but the words of the Lord define us, right? You are redeemed. You are forgiven. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but you've again been forgiven. And that has been guaranteed by Jesus, whose bones were never broken on the cross. I hope that what you're getting the picture of is that your salvation is for you, but it doesn't rest, it rests on you in the sense that you possess it, but it doesn't rest on you in the sense that you have to keep filling it up like your gas tank. Does that make sense? That's part of the point of this, is to show you the. I am very clearly trying to stir your affections for God by showing you his affections for you. That's another method. One way I could just get up and tell you how terrible a person you are and that you need to be working more for God. That's an effective motivator. It's not a good motivator. I am trying to stir your affections for God so that you would live in light of the grace that he has shown you. Okay? Uh, I don't think I've ever said it like that to you all before, but that's kind of how I operate. That's why I talk about Jesus. That's why I talk about what he did for you in spite of you, okay? All right, so these sticks and stones, they may break your bones, but the words of the Lord define us. That's why we are studying these words, so they will get down into us. So then the world, the flesh, and the devil comes to us and starts talking trash to us. We say, no, I am a saint. I am blessed. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. And we will say, I am lavished upon. That's our third word this morning. And lavished upon seems kind of weird. Like, hello, my name is lavished upon. It's not very elegant, right? But it's no less true just because it's clunky. And, you know, preachers have to kind of make things fit in a little form so everything looks good and nice and all that. Um, the fact is, is that you are lavished upon. Now, there's a phenomenon on social media of rich kids displaying their wealth and th there'll be things like they'll have a ta they'll show they'll take a picture of a receipt from a restaurant, and it'll be like $107,524 for the evening, uh, which includes escargot and two dollars bottles of some kind of thing. I don't even know what it is, but it's some kind of alcohol. Um, they used to call them the rich kids of Instagram when they came out. Now there's a bunch of different kind of rich kids because it's trendy and you blah, 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 blah. But you get the point. Uh, one person framed a receipt for a million dollar watch that they bought. So it's not enough to just have the watch. You got to post the receipt so everybody knows this amount of money you've got. Uh, they pose in front of cars and on boats and in beaches and and uh, there was one that I saw that said, you know, this bottle of whatever this expensive liquor is has been open for an hour, so we're going to dump it out and order another one. Things like that. And it's assumed that these kids, and some of them look like, you know, young adults, it's assumed that these funds here have not been earned by these kids, but have rather been given to them by their wealthy parents. And they're busy showing everyone else their lavish lifestyle. They get to enjoy these fine things because of the richness of their fathers. And uh, there's some difference, but in the same way, we get to enjoy the fine richness of our salvation, not because we have earned it, but because our Father planned it. Your Lord Jesus Christ, who is your older brother, purchased it, and the Holy Spirit, who is your comforter and helper, applies it to you. You are the beneficiary of your father's work, just like these rich kids of Instagram are. Because of the riches of God's grace toward us, we enjoy the finest thing in life, which is actually 
redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Have you ever compared your salvation to a steak from Ruth Chris Steakhouse that comes out of the oven on an 800 degree plate with melted butter that's still sizzling on it? I know this is mind warping. Your salvation in Christ is better than that steak. We're not used to thinking like that, are we? It is better. It's tough to believe, but the, I think we can make the case that the scriptures are clear that salvation is Christ, in Christ is more valuable than any silver, gold, platinum, diamond-plated grill, whatever, Bugatti, Ferrari, whatever. The most amazing thing about one of those receipts was that, that they ordered two Cokes and they were only $10 a piece at this place. But you get the point. Your salvation is more precious than these things. Now, I know that we are mostly reasonably down-to-earth people here in Lake County, and we'll look at those rich kids and probably want to take their parents to task for lavishing such riches upon them, thinking that uh, those kids will grow up what? Spoiled. And in the next breath, as recovering Pharisees, we have to ask ourselves if, God lavishing the riches of his grace on us in Christ makes us spoiled. It's not designed to do that. It's never designed to do that. People will say, well, be careful talking about that grace stuff. People will take advantage of it. You've got to be careful. You don't want folks thinking that God actually likes them. <laughs> right? It's right there in, the, in verse 8 which he lavished upon us in what? All wisdom and insight. God thought that it was wise and insightful to lavish riches of Christ on you. He ne it doesn't say he thought it was risky. <laughs> now, when we receive these riches in Christ, our desire is to not be like those rich kids of Instagram, right? Right? I, try, I, I desperately hope that the person who, who, who had the receipt for the $100,000 bar tab was there with their friends, lavishing part of that on their friends, right? Because we have been blessed to be a what? A blessing. So God, in all his wisdom and insight, it was his idea all along... <laughs> to lavish unending grace on you, Christian, far from being a bad idea, it's God's great idea to eulogize, to speak good words of our identity in Christ to us because grace makes us realize it ain't about me. It's about him. So, one of the things when we return to over and over and looking at how we've been graced in peace by giving these name badge names, saint, adopted, blessed, chosen, redeemed, forgiven, lavished upon, is how we embrace this identity and live from that place. So a few weeks ago, we talked about Abraham. He was blessed to be a blessing, right? We wondered how our adoption by God would work itself out in our lives. Maybe we literally adopt somebody or figuratively adopt somebody. Why? Because you have been adopted. Last week, we talked briefly about knowing that we have been chosen and predestined from before the foundation of the world, and that should produce in us an amazement at God's grace, and we should be humbled by his grace. Since God has forgiven you and lavished upon you these identities of redeemed and forgiven, how will that work itself out in our lives? You have been redeemed and forgiven God has lavished his grace upon you. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but the riches of the grace of God to his people should bring good news to our neighbors. You have been lavished upon for God's glory and your neighbor's good. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but your forgiveness is guaranteed by Jesus, whose bones were never broken. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but you've been redeemed and freed from sin by Jesus when he hung on the big sticks that made up the cross and when the stone was rolled away from the tomb. 
Sticks and stones may break your bones, rocks and boulders will crush your shoulders. But church, the resilient words of the Lord define you. And that sounds like there is hope for Lake County and his name is Jesus. And that is good news for you, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, and certainly your enemies. So hear it, believe it, and tell it so that many may live. Let's pray. Father, uh, we ask that as we take this uh, whirlwind tour of the ways you have lavished upon us and blessed us and graced us and peaced us in Christ, that you would uh, stir us to live in response to the goodness that you've shown us so that we might be a blessing to our neighbors and certainly to our enemies. But Father, we need your wisdom to do it. We need your Holy Spirit to do it. So Father, make us more like the Lord Jesus. Help us to love, your, love you. Help us to trust your promises and serve our neighbors more. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Please stand as we close our service this morning with number 327, the old rugged cross. And again, as I've said many times, none of these blessings in Christ come to you apart from the cross.
you go forth from here to love God and serve your neighbor in the kingdom, take with you a good word from the Lord. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all the people said, Amen. Amen.